My name is David Hanman, and I've got one of the most recognisable cars in the world. In November 1970, um, Bertoni introduced at the Turin Motor Show a very futuristic concept car, and this was known as Stratos or Stratos Zero. Um, and it was based on uh, a Fulvia mid engined with a 1600 engine. And at the time, there was really no intent from Bertoni to, to do a production car, it was a pure concept car. This car was seen by the head of Lancia Racing Division at the time. And this was a, a very suave Italian man known as Cesare Fiorio. Fiorio saw Bertoni's concept, approached them, and asked them to design him a rally car. And this is where the idea for Stratos was born. In 1975, um, there's a famous rally in Britain called the RAC Rally, and it came very close to, to, to our home. So I was only nine or ten at the time, and there was a, a car with an amazing shape and a, a, a sound that nearly deafened me. I had very sensitive ears, and this car, but I fell in love with the sound and the look of the car. I used to look through the newspaper and cut photos of the car out and paste them into my scrapbook as a kid. I didn't really know what it was, but I, I just remembered seeing it and uh, wanting one. So when I was 19 I started working and I started travelling overseas and making a little bit of money. And I remember going to a, a, a kit car show with my, with my father and I decided that I wanted a Lamborghini, um, a Countach. So we went to a kit car show and there was a Lamborghini kit car company there and it wasn't very well made. And next to it there was a Lancia Stratos kit and my dad and I looked at this Lancia Stratos kit and it was really well made and we could tell that you know this was this was the kit and this brought back memories from when I was a kid um, and I looked at my old scrapbook and realized that hang on this is this was the car that I'd you know fell in love with when I was 10 years old and I, I ended up buying a replica kit which I built myself I travelled, you know, to events all over the country. I took the car on holiday, and it was a very enjoyable car to have, a real eye opener. And even though it was a replica, people loved it wherever I went. What do you think the then? Heterosexual car. I've never been. <laughs> Say that again. Heterosexual car I've ever been in. <laughs> At the time we made the replicas, there was not much reference material. There were some model cars and one or two books, but we had no access to original cars. So the replicas weren't that well done in the early days. But by five or six years ago with the internet, we could do more research and we could also find people with original parts. So I restored my replica with a lime green paint, which was the exact color that uh, Bertoni used for the cars back in the 70s. And I decided to buy some original seats for the car, which I got from a, a dealer in Turin. And then after I finished restoring my replica, I uh, decided to visit the dealer in Turin. And um, I started pestering him for you know, information about original cars and did he know anybody who had an original car for sale. And after a number of cars that weren't very special, one day he sent me an email with photos of an Alitalia car. And um, it turned out to be the car that I subsequently bought, which was Waldegard's car. This 
success of, of my car started in 1975 where it was first driven by um, Rafael Lele Pinto and he, he drove the car to success in the uh, Alpi Orientale rally in Italy, came first in that. But then uh, for two years after that the car became pretty much exclusively driven by Bjorn Waldegard. He did well in it. Um, in 1975 he won the San Remo Rally in my car. Um, in 1976 he won San Remo Rally as well and um, he came second to Sandro Minari in the Monte Carlo Rally. And the car had a few breakdowns so in the Swedish Rally it broke down, in the Acropolis Rally he ripped the rear bodywork off the car and ripped out the oil pipes at the same time and in the safari there was a flywheel problem. In the 1975 RAC rally which in, in Britain that's 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 really what made Stratos famous. Um, Waldegard lost, lost the rear bodywork. Um, they, they broke a drive shaft, they changed it quickly um, and they abandoned the rear rear bodywork of the car in, in the Clipston Forest. Somewhere out there, that bodywork still exists. Somebody's got it in their garage or shed. Uh, I'd love to see it again. <laughs> When I bought the car, it, it, it looked like a complete car, but it was a barn find. So the, the owner had had the car since the 1980s. He had um, started a restoration, but for whatever reason had stopped the restoration. So this restoration work was already 30 years old. So the restoration process started uh, in, in Italy. Um, things really didn't go smoothly or well with that and I decided uh, to, to collect the car and the parts and bring it all back to the UK. Supervise the restoration myself and finish it closer to home. It took me a while and I, I you know, a few people let me down in, in who can I use to, to assemble the car? Um, I need a workshop, you know, with a, with a bit of space and I need somebody who really knows the, the old school way, way of doing things. And then through an old acquaintance uh, of mine um, who had a Fiat dealership in Somerset, he recommended to me to use a, a guy that used to work for him called Rob, Rob Johnston. Do you want the twister? Well, I think we just need to do it quickly, you know, that's what Lancia would have done, so. Well, about 10 years ago, I used to work in a Fiat garage, a uh, specialist in building rally cars and preparing and uh, headed a rally team for five years. David, the owner of the car, came to me and he asked me if I could do the car. And I just said to him, to me, it's just nuts and bolts, it can be done. So we carried on and agreed to bring the car in and start work on it. The car comes in, uh, it's, in it's sort of together but very loosely, so it all had to come apart again and be done properly. Uh, and we built up a relationship as we got going. Uh, the initial build from first spanner to MOT was uh, stripped back and rebuild within six weeks. Uh, and then it's took another further couple of years to uh, fine tune it to what it is now. Uh, taking a lot of time looking at lots of photographs together, uh, working out what different components are, where they go, how they fit, and just working through little by little to get the car to how it is now. And one day I got a new book from a well-known author um, who's a German chap and uh, I saw a photo of my car in there. So uh, in the credits in the book I found the contact details of the photographer. Reinhard Klein contacted him and he told me, well I've got photos of your car from many different events. And he was kind enough to let me have uh, probably two or three hundred photos. And as I started to study these photos, I saw more and more witness marks that were evident on my chassis. And 
it was quite apparent at this stage that the restoration should be done as a, a safari restoration. There were bolts in the roof to mount the spare wheel to. The antenna hole was moved for the safari rally. So in all the other rallies and on, on most of the other works cars, the radio communications antenna is in the middle of the roof. But on the safari cars, because there was a spare wheel over the middle of the roof, the antenna was moved back and to the side. And my chassis was showing all those safari modifications. So I decided, okay, safari, that's what we're, that's what we're gonna do. I chose to do something a bit different. There are very few safari cars um, still existing and none at the moment that get seen. So I wanted to build a safari car that would be seen. Since the car's been finished, we've done Rally Day, which is at Castle Coombe. That's the biggest rally, historic rally event in the UK. Um, this year we did the Goodwood Festival of Speed Forest Stages, and uh, a lot of people said, how can you take this car through the forest? And I felt I had to do it. Um, the car's so important in history that it needs to be seen again. A lot of cars like this go into collections and never get seen and I, I just wanted to you know, give, it, give the car its, its due credit without destroying it of course, but you know, that's why we did that. One day I had a phone call from David to say that we'd had a, or he'd had an invite to Goodwood Festival of Speed via Lord March uh, and because he'd had a recent cycling accident he asked me if I'd be willing to drive it. Of course I had to say yes, it was a, one of my lifetime ambitions to actually drive a car that was capable of being driven through the forest at speed. The car itself is a real driver's car. You can't be calm, you can't be relaxed, you've got to be on the ball all the time, you've got to tame the beast and you really have got to tame the beast. If you relax, she'll have you. And the way she'll have you is the back end will overtake the front. Uh, as long as you keep the power on and you keep confident with it, then you're okay. But as soon as you hesitate, you haven't got time to hesitate, it'll be over. When, when we go to shows, many times, so many times, we've been approached by people who say, well, I, I was there, I was a young boy, and this car nearly killed me in the RAC rally. It hit the fence next to me and um, lost the rear bodywork. I think it lost it twice in that race. That's happened two or three times where, you know, 50-year-old guys have come up and said, I actually saw this car back then. Um, I recently spoke to a journalist who saw the car when he was three years old and he's now quite a successful journalist in the motoring world and he attributes his career to seeing that car when he was three years old. So this is the effect it has on people. It's something that almost makes your hair stand up when you think about it. Certainly driving it, it, make, you know, it makes your hair stand up and thinking about driving it, it makes your hair stand up. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.